Hey now, it's time for another video from Wrestling's Greatest Moments. Wrestling history is full of epic fails. Whether it's old school disaster pieces like WrestleMania 2, indie ones like Heroes of Wrestling, or big budget ones like December to Dismember that prove you can't polish a turd. While fans have their favorite flops, it's difficult to beat WCW's Uncensored, a pay-per-view that should have been euthanized after its debut, but which almost managed to creep its way to WCW's well-deserved demise in 2001. Don't believe us? Sit back as Wrestling's Greatest Moments looks at the loathsome legacy of Uncensored. To say that Uncensored got off to an auspicious start would be true, but then again, so did the Titanic. Uncensored debuted in 1995, a year recognized by many fans and historians as one of the worst years in professional wrestling, as Hulkamania ran wild in WCW like a case of dysentery, while the WWF threw albatrosses like King Mabel as a lifeline for its sinking ship. Undoubtedly, Uncensored certainly did nothing to dissuade fans of the notion that wrestling was going the way of roller derby. In 1995, Hulkamania could do no wrong. At least in the minds of Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff, who continued pushing the Hulkster down the WCW fans' throats. To be sure, Hogan's early run in WCW was a success, but it didn't take Hogan long to wear out his red and yellow welcome, especially when WCW sacrificed one homegrown wrestler after another to Hogan and its seemingly endless parade of ex-WWF stars who had jumped to WCW. In 1995, WCW decided to go with what was billed as a hardcore style event, albeit under PG rules, billing its, its March 19, 1995 pay-per-view as Uncensored. Announcer Tony Schiavone seemingly dropped the word Uncensored every 30 seconds, a testament both to his ability to show and keep a straight face at the most intelligent insulting product. On paper, some potential classics such as a strap match between Vader and Hulk Hogan, a Falls Count Anywhere match between the Nasty Boys and Harlem Heat, and even a martial arts match between Meng and Jim Duggan that gave fans who were tired of Duggan the chance to see Hacksaw breathe his last. Like any WCW show at the time, it also had the potential to destroy the time-space continuum with its sheer ridiculousness. The boxer versus wrestler match between Johnny B. Bad and Arn Anderson made fans of the Enforcer grimace, while the King of the Road match between Dustin Rhodes and the Blacktop Bullies, a match that took place on a moving flatbed truck, only saving grace was that no one in WCW had thought of making it had thought of making it a scaffold match on a moving truck. 1995's Uncensored surpassed anyone's expectation as to how bad the show could be. The event anticipated Vince Russo's disastrous run in WCW with its overbooking and complete lack of logic. The King of the Road match was difficult to watch, both for the poor quality, but also for the vertigo-inducing camera shots as the truck moved along. The object of this oddity was for the two wrestlers to fight their way from the back of a fenced-in flatbed and toot the air horn at the front of the flatbed. Dustin Rhodes and the Blacktop Bully, whose past successes as Crusher Khrushchev, Demolition Smash, and Repo Man couldn't hold a candle to the Bully or his future Mr. Hole-in-One character, put their lives on the line as they battled their way through the unforgiving bales of hay covering the floor while the truck moved at what looked like a fast and furious speed of 10 miles per hour. Perhaps a match's only redeeming moment came when the truck had to stop in order for a church bus to pass. If Vince Russo was booking this, the truck would have crashed into a bus full of nuns. Somehow, Dustin Rhodes and the Blacktop Bully managed to get themselves fired for the match thanks to the two men blading, despite WCW's no blading policy. Yes, Uncensored didn't allow blood. Other lowlights included the no rules match between Macho Man Randy Savage and Avalanche, aka the WWF's Earthquake John Tenta, that ended with Savage winning by disqualification after a woman attacked Savage. While the announcers were befuddled as to who the woman was, the nose nose and the style and profile of that beat could unmistakably only belong to one man, Nature Boy Ric Flair. That ain't no woman, it's a man, man. Flair, who had been forced to retire the previous year after losing a retirement match against Hulk Hogan, was only happy to help Avalanche beat down Hogan's pal, Randy Savage. Never one to pass on a chance to steal the spotlight, the Hulkster ran in for the save. In WCW's defense, the Falls Count Anywhere match delivered as the Nasty Boys and Harlem Heat battled in an action-packed brawl. 
The bow featured an homage to the classic Tupelo concession stand brown. How did WCW pull this off and an otherwise horrific night? Just remember, even a broken clock is right twice a day. Naturally, the real disaster was reserved for the main event, a match between WCW's resident Monster Hill Vader and WCW champion Hulk Hogan. Wrestling lore has it that Hogan was in no hurry to step into the ring against Vader, thanks to the big man's well-deserved reputation for potatoing opponents in the ring. It probably didn't help that the fans in the internet wrestling community, which was already taking on a life of its own, repeatedly called for Vader to shoot on Hogan. The strap match stipulation may have given Hogan cause for concern, but to his credit, the Orange Goblin, as critics had nicknamed him, worked the match. As critics had nicknamed him, Work the match. Of course, no match is complete without a compelling storyline driving it, and here the Hulkster discovered his manager Jimmy Hart was missing in action, presumably kidnapped and taken to a remote facility, not to be confused with a remote medical facility, by Vader and his new BFF, Ric Flair. Adding to the high-stakes drama was the return of the Ultimate Warrior. Oh, no, that was a wrestler who WCW tried to pass off as Ultimate Warrior, the Renegade. A cheap knockoff of the Ultimate Warrior that WCW seemed to think might fool the fans. More about the Renegade in a future video. Ric Flair attacked Hogan, but his efforts proved futile as Hogan dragged him around the ring, tagging the four turnbuckles. Never mind that Slick Rick wasn't competing. As bad as Uncensored was, it didn't stop WCW from rolling out a sequel in 1996. This pay-per-view didn't feature an excess of stipulation matches, but what it lacked in quantity, it made up for in sheer awfulness. You didn't think we are going to say quality. Of course, we're talking about the Doomsday Cage match featuring the team of Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage versus the Alliance to end Hulkamania. That's not to say that the undercard was anything for fans to look forward to, except perhaps for the authors of the future literary masterpiece, WrestleCrap. Take a look at some of these woeful bouts. The Giant vs. Loch Ness. Colonel Parker vs. Medusa. The Booty Man vs. Diamond Dallas Page. The Doomsday Cage match symbolized everything wrong with WCW, a promotion that had plenty of big names but didn't know how to use them except as a poor man's version of the 1980s WWF. On paper, the Doomsday Cage match looked like it could be so over the top that it might work, with a foreboding structure featuring three levels of cages and the mega powers, Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage, facing the Alliance to end Hulkamania in a bout that was billed as a battle of survival. The odds seem stacked against Hogan and Savage as they face Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, Ming, the Barbarian, Lex Luger, the Taskmaster, aka Kevin Sullivan, Z Gangsta, and the Ultimate Solution. Not only that, but the heels were accompanied by three of WCW's deadliest dames, Miss Elizabeth, Woman, and Jimmy Hart. As insane as a Doomsday Cage match was, the real fun was a build-up which saw the Taskmaster align his forces in the Dungeon of Doom with several other heels such as Ric Flair, Lex Luger, and Arn Anderson. The Taskmaster even brought in Hogan's old sparring partner from the WWF, Zeus, with WCW giving him the lawyer-friendly name of Z Gangsta. WCW had apparently received enough cease and desist orders from the WWF for the array of ex-WWF superstars like the big boss man in Earthquake who tried to use their trademark characters in WCW. Regrettably, when the Taskmaster introduced big man Jeep Svensson, WCW christened him the final solution, apparently failing to have received the memo about Nazi Germany and its plan for the Jews. Svensson, whose time as a final solution would be forgotten thanks to his much maligned portrayal of Bane in the 1997 disaster Batman and Robin, would be repackaged as the ultimate solution. The Doomsday Cage match avoided the obvious problem of Hogan and Savage flat out destroying eight heels, including several main eventers at once. Although knowing Hogan's reputation for looking out for number one, it seems likely he would have gone along with it. How, you ask? by having Hogan and Savage face the team of wrestlers in the cage's various compartments. The Mega Powers squared off against Arn Anderson and Ric Flair on the top floor of the cage before escaping through a trap door at the second level. Color commentator Dusty Rhodes, who made the event as painful to listen to as it was to watch, reminded fans that the wrestlers were, were competing on a chain-link fence, and even suggested that they take a piece of fence and stand on it to see how unforgiving it was. Bobby the Brain Heenan wasn't going to let Dusty's dumbass comment go unanswered, 
and the brand told fans to bring their neighbor over and put them in a figure four leg lock, even adding that fans might want to put their dog in a figure eight leg lock. The match had its moments as Hogan and Savage fought off the Taskmaster Lex Luger in the faces of fear, Ming and the Barbarian, then in an anticlimactic moment that epitomized WCW's complete lack of logic, Hogan and Savage exited the cage's second floor in order to pummel Luger and the Taskmaster in an outside ring. The announcers did what any WCW announcer should do when faced with such a nonsensical moment. They glossed over it as the carnage continued in and out of the ring. Finally, Z Gangsta and the Ultimate Solution made their way into the ring manhandling Hogan and Savage and throwing them back into the cage. Things looked grim for the faces, especially when Arn Anderson and Ric Flair entered the first floor of the cage, despite being eliminated. The heels pummeled the Mega Powers, while Hogan and Savage appeared to be reaching for foreign objects. Was it Hogan's creative control clause? No, a mound of white powder that looked like the climactic finale of Scarface was suddenly all over the mat. Was Hogan finally going to reveal the source of all his energy? We'll never know as the Mega Powers threw white powder into the heel's eyes as the Booty Man, a.k.a. Ed Leslie, handed Hogan and Savage frying pans. At least the announcers described them as frying pans. In reality, they looked like Jiffy Pop containers without the real butter flavor popcorn inside them. By now, you probably know how this one ended, and if you say Hogan and Savage put over eight heels, you're obviously new to the grappling game. The Mega Powers won, fighting off the Alliance to end Hulkamania. Thankfully, change was coming as Scott Hall and Kevin Ash were headed to WCW, and the New World Order storyline was just a few months away. However, with this infusion of fresh blood and arguably the greatest storyline in wrestling history improve uncensored, 1997's Uncensored provided a breath of fresh air compared to the first two editions. While it would be wrong to say WCW could do no wrong during this period, Starcade 97's match between Sting and Hulk Hogan, anyone? The show featured a number of strong matches and avoided the gimmicky garbage of 95 and 96's show. Perhaps in a nod to previous Uncensored's, WCW featured a Glacier vs. Mortis match just to remind fans it wasn't perfect. 1998's Uncensored might look good on paper, but as anyone familiar with the WC product of this era knows, the NWA was overbooked, leading to the usual fizzled finishes such as the Giant vs. Kevin Nash ending on a disqualification and a cage match between Hollywood Hogan and Randy Savage faring no better. Like most matches involving the wrestlers in black and white, it ended with outside interference with Brian Adams getting Kevin Nash disqualified by hitting the Giant with a baseball bat, and the Hogan Savage main event ending in a no contest thanks to interference from the Disciple. 1999 wasn't a good year for WCW, and Uncensored did nothing to change fans' perception that WCW was in serious trouble. While 1999's event wasn't as bad as the first two Uncensored's, the blockbuster bout between Stevie Ray and, and Vincent, aka Virgil, for leadership of the black and white NWL certainly didn't get things off on the right foot. The main event between Ric Flair and Hulk Hogan was overbooked, but still a good way to breathe some life into the tired Hogan vs. Flair program. Alas, all good things, and in this case, all bad things, must come to an end. And as WCW circled the drain, Uncensored made its final mark on pay-per-view history. Incredibly, WCW's not-so-creative team missed out on a great opportunity to showcase some of its worst matches at Uncensored. For example, Uncensored didn't host the WCW Junkyard Invitational. That honor was reserved for Bash at the Beach or the Judy Bagwell on a forklift match, which graced fans with its presence at 2000's New Blood Rising event. Despite these missed opportunities, WCW still worked hard to assure the final Uncensored would go out on an epic note. Indeed, not since Homer told the tale of the Trojan War and the Iliad had fans been given such a grand stage to watch a battle between good and evil take place. Things came full circle as Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair battled in a strap match at the last Uncensored, much as they had at the first. Although to WCW's credit, this match at least had Flair booked to compete. Here, Hulk Hogan sought revenge on his longtime nemesis after Slick Rick and Lex Luger did their best to rid the world of Jimmy Mouth of the South Heart. Hogan tearfully told the fans that Hart himself had given Hogan the secret of finally defeating Flair by engaging in a yep-happy Indian strap match. With Hart's last breath, he muttered, yep-happy, 
Fortunately, Hart had a miraculous recovery, leading the hoaxer to call for a Yapapi Indian Strat match, about so dangerous it could only be held at uncensored. Hogan triumphed, once again defying logic as he tagged Flair to the turnbuckle three times before leg dropping him and pinning him for the 1-2-3. The hoaxer then remembered the rules of the match and tagged the turnbuckle for the fourth time, apparently turning this one fall match into a two out of three falls affair. What do you think of the legacy of WCW Uncensored? Are there any pay-per-view events just as bad or perhaps even worse? Share your thoughts in the comment section and let us know if there's any videos you'd like wrestling's greatest moments to cover. In the meantime, subscribe to our channel, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and spread the good news about wrestling's greatest moments, the channel that celebrates a squared circle.